Welcome back to the Shrikecast. My name is Andrew Krauthamel, and today we are going to go over the SonicWall Global VPN client. Uh, the Global VPN client is the uh, older method of remote access uh, to your network through your SonicWall. Uh, you have to install their uh, global VPN client onto the computer in question and it ends up using port 500 UDP instead of uh, 4433 uh, TCP like we had <clears throat> on the uh, the other uh, the other video on SSL VPN so today we are going to uh, go through that setting up a GVC connection a, a uh, remote access using the global VPN client at the live demo site and you'll notice that the live demo uh, has changed so we have a little bit new interface with the uh, sonic wall website here so we're just going to go to UTM and I'm going to load up the TZ200 today just for fun uh, again almost all of these features are identical between the different models certain models just have faster processors more memory and stuff like that um, all right, so here we are on our TZ200, and you see on the right we have Global VPN client licensed with one license. If you buy uh, a TZ100 or some of the other TZ lines, uh, they do not come with a license for GVC out of the box. They are pushing SSL VPN, like I mentioned in the other video. So, if you want to use this functionality, you'll have to pay uh, extra licensing for this. I believe it's about 50 bucks a pop uh, for each user, uh, each concurrent user I should say, <clears throat> unless you buy a higher level model uh, at which times these are sometimes bundled in in various amounts. Or you have an older sonic wall and you're following along with something such as a TZ190 or a Pro Series or something like that, at which point you'll have a bunch of these licenses. So we're going to go down to our VPN area and we have WAN Group VPN. So WAN Group VPN is the built-in VPN policy for GVC, remote access. And then additionally we have a WLAN, a wireless group VPN policy, so that you can do uh, an encrypted IPsec tunnel over a uh, wireless connection if you have that functionality. So what we care about is the WAN Group VPN group VPN for this type of setup from the outside world. Uh, if it's not enabled, you'll want to enable, which I can't do in the live demo because we're in non-config mode, but you'll want to enable your, w, uh, your WAN group VPN, and then we're going to go and configure it. Once this pops up, you'll notice that there's an authentication method we can choose. Uh, if you wish to have certificates on your laptops or whatever it might be, if you're in a larger enterprise environment, that might make more sense for you. So people, uh, you don't have to have a shared password amongst all of your uh, workstations and laptops. Otherwise, for those of us with simpler needs, uh, Ike using a pre-shared secret is just fine. The only downfall is that every person who you configure is going to use the same shared secret for their group VPN. That's not to say everyone has the same username and password, uh, but just for the purposes of creating your Ike tunnel, it, it uses the, the same shared secret for each tunnel for each person, and then they authenticate with username and password after the fact. So you'll want to note this shared secret. It's uh, auto-generated in your firmware, and unless you check off an option later on uh, in a few tabs I'll show you, you're going to need to take this shared secret and paste it into the GVC client when you install it and uh, configure a policy in your GVC client. Uh, it'll ask you for the shared secret once you try to connect. <clears throat> it's a one-time thing. It only asks you once and then it saves it inside the config forever. But you can make it simpler uh, if it, the security is not as much of a concern for you. So we'll show that in a second. So make sure you note your shared secret uh, if you choose to leave things rather default. We can go to our proposals and change our encryption level. So you'll note here that we don't have an option for Ike v2. This is a bit of an older connection method. So it's going to use uh, standard aggressive mode and we can have some different encryption options that are available to us within that mode. So we're using Ike v1 
Uh, I like to bump it up to AES-256 with Group 5. As you probably have noticed from my other videos, I seem to prefer AES quite a bit. And we can leave the rest the same. Uh, if you want to drop down the lifetime so that the tunnel uh, renegotiates sooner, be my guest. But if you're using a higher level encryption, it's um, relatively secure. <clears throat> and I, I chuckle because I think I mentioned in one of the other videos, it can take upwards of 70 million or billion years to crack AES-256. So, next up we have our advanced tab. Uh, here is where you might want to enable some options such as NetBIOS rebroadcasting uh, to try and help your older clients that run Windows and use the uh, My Network uh, folder sharing and things like that. If people rely on that uh, icon that uses the old NetBIOS protocol, which is uh, a very old and simple broadcast based IPv4 protocol. So, uh, you'll want to enable rebroadcasting if you intend to use that. If you have newer clients and you have a DNS server and things like that internally in your enterprise and you have that shared out with your DHCP settings, then it's really not that big of a problem, but it's nice to have on if you're in a big Windows environment. You can also enable multicast rebroadcasting in a similar manner if you have a use for multicast over your group VPN. Uh, and we have XAuth. So XAuth is the uh, checkbox that says yes we need to have people also use a username and password if you don't want them to have to do that you can actually disable it so that they only use that shared secret on the general tab and then they're in most of the time almost all of us keep the X off the uh, extended authentication enabled and then you can choose a group that people have to live under their user has to be under in order to use the group VPN connection uh, by default, it's trusted users. Uh, you can make a separate one if you want called remote users or something like that. Um, I like to use the built-ins just to make things simple for migrations later on to newer firmware versions. Uh, another thing that's useful to turn on is management via the uh, Security Association. If you do a lot of, uh, if you don't want to enable HTTPS or SSH to the WAN, uh, as I showed in one of the other videos, you can enable uh, management to your sonic wall through your GVC connection. Uh, so you have an encrypted tunnel that you're doing your management over. It's a bit more secure if, if that's what you, uh, you prefer. So then you can enable the protocols you wish for the management over your GVC connection. Last up, we have our client tab, which we have some options on saving passwords and do I want to do split tunnels and things like that. Uh, I like to say that, yeah, people can save their passwords because I deal with a lot of external clients that don't remember their usernames and passwords or the, they, you know, they'll have a username and password for their SonicWall, username and password for their system, their, their server, a username and password for their application, a username and password within the application. So that, Having people remember so many of them is uh, difficult. <clears throat> so I always end up setting this to always so that I have that option of keeping it simple for people to connect. If you have a higher security environment, feel free to change it to never and make them type it in every time. Uh, we also have some options for how we get our IP address and how we route our traffic. So the top here we have how do we get our IP address for our virtual adapter. The virtual adapter is basically the uh, the GVC software on your your remote computer. So the wherever you install that GVC software it's going to create a SonicWall <clears throat> VPN uh, network adapter. How does that network adapter get an IP address that's routable within our network here? I normally set this to DHCP lease or manual. I like to have the option of manual just in case I have a special a special case out there where somebody needs a manual IP address assigned for you know some sort of weird printing problem or something like that. Uh, but by default, it'll check for DHCP IP off of our DHCP server internally, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, I also enable split tunnels quite often. Um, it's 99% of the time I have split tunnels which is the default option here uh, that says that 
any of the internal network, uh, any of the internal subnet goes through the VPN, the GVC connection to your uh, sonic wall and to your LAN. And then anything that is headed out to the internet or, or wherever else you're trying to go to other internal networks, if it's not destined for this LAN, uh, whatever the sonic wall is set to for its LAN IPs or its LAN subnets, uh, have it split off and go out to the internet connection at that remote location. So only send the traffic that's necessary for uh, for business to operate over this network. So split tunnels really reduces your bandwidth. If you don't have split tunnels enabled, uh, all the traffic will go through the GVC connection, through your WAN, into the sonic wall, and then figure out, well, okay, well, where does it go to, where does it route to? Does it go out to Google? Okay, well, now I've got to route it back out my WAN, back to the GVC, back to the client. It's, it's very slow, although it's high security. You get the option of making sure that people aren't browsing uh, inappropriate or... Um, insecure websites while they have a secure connection to your local network. So if you uh, are not sure of people's uh, security software that's installed on their computers, you might not want to use Split Tunnel because then you can filter every bit of traffic while they're connected to your network through the GVC. Uh, if that is not as much of a concern and you know that the workstations are relatively secure and they have up-to-date virus scans and everything like that, you can just split tunnels and reduce the bandwidth necessary for your WAN connection. You can also turn on default key for simple client provisioning. Uh, this is what I mentioned where on the general tab you have your shared secret. If you don't have default key for simple client provisioning turned on, it will ask you for that shared key on that general tab. If you have this checked off, it has one built into the software that it uses and you don't have to type anything in. Uh, it's up to you as to how uh, how easily you want people to connect to your network. If you have this disabled, they have to take do one more step and get you to give them the shared key. So, so you have a bit more security if you don't use that. So once you have that configured, you can just go ahead and click OK. This will Your WAN Group VPN will be enabled. Uh, which you did and then also configured properly. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to want to do is set up that DHCP I mentioned. So hopefully you have DHCP uh, already configured on your sonic wall and you're using that as your main system. If not, you might have to set up a, a DHCP helper address to, to send your DHCP request somewhere else. But in a very basic setup, uh, you'll have the sonic wall running as your DHCP server and then uh, we're going to also use the internal DHCP server on the sonic wall to give out IP addresses for these GVC clients. And you'll note that that's different from the SSL VPN guys because they use a pool of addresses that you configure uh, under the SSL VPN section. So it's a, it's a bit different. I like the DHCP method better. I'm not sure why they chose to do a pool, uh, a separate range uh, under the SSL VPN section. Kind of wish they would do it this way. But what we do is we go and do configure here for our central gateway and we're going to say use the internal DHCP server for global VPN. A lot of people miss this option so make sure you go in here and turn this option on. If you don't want to use your internal DHCP server, say you're in a larger enterprise environment and you have uh, a Windows DHCP server or something like that, you can relay your address, your DHCP to somewhere else, whatever that might be. So most people will have something like this <clears throat> where it'll have the internal DHCP server turned on and for GVC. So you can go ahead and click OK there. <clears throat> and then the last thing you have to do is really create a local user. So in this example we're doing local users. You can also do radius authentication, LDAP integration, things like that. If you have a, uh, a domain set up there's knowledge base articles on that. I might do something down the line on a, a video on that one. But in this example, we'll have just a local user. Uh, so you'll go into your users, local users. You're going to add someone. And we're going to add Bob here. Bob has an awesome password of 12345. And you, there's other info here for you know what you want to fill out about this user if you want to track people real carefully. Most of us are lazy and we don't. Uh, but we'll go into groups and see how 
so they're automatically added to that trusted user group which was also the group that we had for our WAN group VPN it said that it wanted to look at people under trusted users for XAuth so that's where you might want to make a separate group called GVC people or something like that and you have to manually add them in as a member otherwise users created uh, local users created automatically have the ability to do GVC uh, if they wish because they'll automatically be interested users so if you leave everything default you have a slight security hole there you also want to define what networks that user can access so again if they're a member of a group you can actually set this type of uh, access under group uh, as well and it'll inherit that uh, configuration but in this example I'm just doing it under this one individual user uh, so normally you'd, you'd change, select something such as your exo subnet or your LAN subnets and you just add that to your access list and then you also have some options for bookmarks if you end up using the uh, uh, the office the virtual office most of the time you won't need that for at least for this setup and you can go ahead and click OK and then you'll add your user in that's pretty much all you need to do to get it to work uh, and you'll go into uh, GVC and uh, add a policy add your public IP or DDNS name it'll pop up once you try to connect and say I need my uh, I need my shared key you'll copy and paste that unless you chose simple uh, client provisioning it'll ask you then for a username and password which we just created and then you should be connected uh, one thing to note about that though is uh, as well as uh, with SSL VPN and GVC VPN and every other type of VPN connectivity we're talking about routing here as, as the core so you note that you can't have your remote people's networks their home networks their office networks wherever they might be trying to connect from the same subnet as your LAN subnets at your office at your SonicWell side so there's ways of having people GVC into a special DMZ that has a certain range which is hopefully not used in most places around the world and you can get around it there but if you have your local network set to 192.168.1.0 and someone's at home and their network is 192.168.1.0 your routing is not going to work right your GVC is not going to work right. You have to have those two subnets different. So that's that's one little tip I, I, I have is set your office network. I'm, I'm assuming you're if you're configuring a sonic wall, you're setting up an office or something like that. Your LAN behind your sonic wall to be something a little abnormal. So you know use a 172.16 or use 10.5. something or, or anything other than the most standard IP address out there on the on the uh, local networks. Stay away from 192.168.0.1. Stay uh, stay away f uh, from 10.0. Stay away from those really basic uh, IPs that are used by most routers out there, and you'll make your life a lot easier. Otherwise, you have to do all sorts of trickery and and changing people's home networks, and it's a major nuisance. So that's it for today. Uh, and we will continue with some troubleshooting things and uh, additional videos as we go forward here every Wednesday. Uh, if you enjoyed these videos, please subscribe and like the video. Give uh, comments and feedback. I enjoy hearing uh, any comments people have. Uh, also, check out my blog at andrewkrauthemmel.com for networking and security information and shriketools.com, which is a managed uh, security provider for small and medium businesses. And I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you for watching.